Hi, everybody. Welcome back to The Reason We Learn. I'm Deb Philman, mom, homeschooler, and one of my commenters pointed out, this would still be relevant to know, ex-teacher. Okay, I do have experience as a teacher. I am currently a tutor. I am singularly focused on education, I would say, and how everything is affected by it and impacts it, um, and individualist. So one of these days, I'll get this intro nailed down to where it really expresses who I am succinctly, but I wanted to be very careful that I wasn't saying educator and having people thinking I was part of this awful industrial system that I'm working so hard to change uh, because I'm not. Tried to do it within the system, didn't work. Now I'm on the outside trying to just leave it behind and create something new. Yesterday, I made a video about um, wokeshinary words, what I call wokeshinary words. James Lindsay and New Discourses calls them uh, translations from the wokish. He calls it wokish. Um, I just call them wokeshinary words. And I do that on purpose because these words that are used by the woke um, have actual definitions, have legitimate dictionary definitions that do not necessarily match how they're used by people for who who are espousing, you know, sort of the woke view of things and pushing uh, woke ideology into our schools in particular, but also into the rest of our society. Um, today, I'm going to go about the definitions for today a little differently. Yesterday, I referenced James's site, New Discourses, and his much more complex, in-depth definitions. Today, I'm going to actually use his pages for these because unlike white supremacy and racism and then those word salad terms, all of which are in here, by the way, but I'm not going to cover them from here. Um, these three really need to be looked at in terms of what they actually mean and then how they're perverted. Because when you are looking at your own school and your school's approach to this, it's going to be very important for you not to knee jerk. We want to encourage the proper use of these words because when they are properly used, they are actually beneficial to all of us in our workplaces and our schools and you know for our kids everything these words are not inherently bad white supremacy especially the way it's used right now has absolutely no appropriate application in america today unless you are absolutely literally describing white supremacists okay racism likewise is so overused as to be meaningless so that's why i kind of did them differently here i want to be a little more specific because i don't want to throw the proverbial baby out with the bathwater these are the famous diversity, equity, and inclusion. You may see it uh, advertised as DEI. You may hear that acronym come up, DEI training. Your workplace might say we have to go for DEI training or diversity, equity, inclusion training. Now, I think you should be on your guard. I think if you hear DEI training or diversity, equity, inclusion training, or you start seeing your company or your school hiring a lot of people to permanently staff a department for this, that should give you pause. That should be a giant red flag, okay? This is something that can be done, let's say, annually perhaps for staff or only for new staff if you're talking about a company or even teachers incoming to a school. This is something that could be done with high school students on their way to college perhaps um, appropriately. These kinds of conversations could be had, um, but... If you start hiring professionals, most of whom are very highly paid, and staff permanently staff an office, what happens, especially in a bureaucracy like a school, is they have to create work for themselves. That means they have to find problems. They have to meet, start seeing problems everywhere they look. Otherwise, their existence isn't justified. Their salary doesn't make sense. And that's where the problems begin. That's where the misapplication of the terms and the bastardization of them comes in. So look at what they're doing. Are there, you know, temporarily hiring somebody or doing a lesson plan and then it's going to, you know, they're going to move on from there, you know, look at the contents and decide. I would say presently we're looking at about 95% inappropriate use, bastardization of terms, maybe 5% appropriate. I'm only cautioning you because I know that some workplaces are catching on and they're doing it right. I've also had an interview with somebody on my channel who does do it right. And I would encourage you if you have the opportunity with your workplace or your school to volunteer to be part of the select selection team to choose somebody who does it right because this can add value to the school, to your organization. But again, you have to be very careful how you do it. So let's go into these. Diversity first. Now, James talks about how the the concept 
I'm not gonna read all of this to you. The concept encompasses acceptance and respect. When I interviewed Danique, uh, Danique Blake, she made the same point that it's really about manners. It's about mutual respect. It's about all people. It's about all humans and how we acknowledge that we are not the same, that no two individuals are the same. And likewise, that we are not avatars for any specific identity group, that just because we look a certain way or come from a certain faith background or a certain ethnicity, that that doesn't mean that it's appropriate to walk up to us or, or, or speak about us and, and as if we are the ambassadors for everyone who has these superficial characteristics, okay? That would be insensitive. Some people call it racist. I don't. I call it insensitive. I call it rude, right? I think we need to get back to these terms that we used to understand. It, you know, you could call someone ignorant who did it repeatedly even after being corrected. Um, you definitely call them rude, but the person who does it once or twice, I think you might just say this person is um, not culturally literate. They're not skilled at, you know, understanding different cultures. That would apply to pretty much all of our children, all right? Children, first of all, are very self-involved. They are um, self-centered beings by nature, especially very young children. That's normal. That's absolutely the way their brains work. It's a survival skill. So it's not that they are bad or bad people in training or anything like that. It's that this is that they have their limit. They're limited. So teaching children manners, teaching them that not everybody is just like you, not everybody sees the world exactly the way you do, is about where you'd go with like elementary school and diversity. Then you get up to middle school and you might get into a little more detail about it. But again, no value judgments. You wouldn't be saying this person's a good person, that person's a bad person, this one comes from an oppressive race, that one comes. Then you're, you're getting into territory that has nothing to do with diversity. That's preaching, right? That's value judgment. That's putting people in boxes. That's doing the exact opposite of respecting others for their differences. So real diversity is about respecting and treating other people as though they are not just carbon copies of ourselves because we seem to share superficial characteristics and they're not our enemy because they don't or because they bear a resemblance to someone who might have previously been a literal enemy of people who look like us or of us individually. That's just bigotry, okay? And it's rude. So it also goes to not just appearances and identities, but it goes to ideas. Real diversity respects a diversity of thought that people will arrive at any given conversation with a different outlook on the world, a different outlook on this specific problem, a different level of knowledge and understanding, and that we, to be polite and to be, uh, to value diversity, we need to be listening as much as we are speaking. That we don't just talk over someone or pass somebody because they have a different view. We don't start with your wrong we first try to understand where they're coming from, et cetera. That doesn't mean we'll end up agreeing with them. And it doesn't mean we'll even respect their view when we're done hearing why they hold it. We, we reserve judgment, okay? That's diversity. Unfortunately, unfortunately, and, and he says, diversity means more than just acknowledging and or tolerating difference. Diversity is a set of conscious practices that involve understanding and appreciating interdependence of humanity, cultures, and natural environment. Most of us would agree with that. Practicing mutual respect, for qualities and experiences that are different from our own, also just basic manners. Understanding that diversity includes not only ways of being, but also ways of knowing. Also true, but it doesn't mean, and I gotta, I gotta qualify this in, in, in terms of schooling, it doesn't mean things like, well, you know, two plus two could equal five. No, <laughs> they're, they're still objective fact, objective knowledge. So different ways of knowing I'm a little skeptical about. I'd have to understand what he meant by that, but be careful with that one because that can be used to justify things like woke math and to telling you that, you know, math with objective answers, correct answers, and, and or grammar and literature, things like that, that these things are inherently racist or lacking in diversity uh, because they don't allow for a different way of knowing. Well, you might have a different way of, of arriving at four, but it's still going to be four. Recognizing that personal, cultural, and institutionalized discrimination creates and sustains privileges for some while creating and sustaining disadvantages for others. That's one that is debatable also. Um, I think you can recognize these things. The problem comes in when you take that recognition and you jump to value judgment and you jump to a solution that, that there is a solution or should be a solution that involves imposing something on the others. 
okay? As opposed to finding ways to shore up your own rights or protect your own interests and make sure that the disadvantages that you are experiencing are not literally imposed, okay? So for example, if you're born into poverty, somebody else is born into wealth, neither of those two children chose that situation. So is the one disadvantaged in terms of wealth? Yes, but we don't know what other things this child, the, the wealthy child has to deal with. Maybe the poor child has a family that loves him and is there for them. The rich child, the parents are never home and they're you know dealing with nannies or latchkey or whatever, or perhaps it's vice versa. Okay, so you might have layers of advantage, layers of disadvantage, but none of this is being imposed. In other words, the disadvantaged child is not disadvantaged because the other one is advantaged. So the solution is not going to be to take from this one. And we'll get into that when we talk about equity. So if you want to look at how can we scaffold for the child who was born into poverty, single parent, not able to be home a lot, not able to read to the child, doesn't have books in the home, maybe they don't get as an early a start on reading as the child who has lots of books and lots of money and lot for tutors, etc. We can have that conversation. We can recognize that these things have created advantages that have carried over time, but they were not done intentionally. They happen. And the way to fix them is not to punish the people who have advantages. That's not going to help the person with a disadvantage, right? Um, so it says diversity includes, therefore, knowing how to relate to those qualities and conditions that are different from our own and outside the groups to which we belong, yet are present in other individuals and groups. These include but are not limited to age, ethnicity, class, gender, physical abilities, quality, race, sexual orientation, as well as religious status, gender expression, educational background, et cetera, et cetera, and so forth, Okay. So as he points out, the first thing to notice about this definition of diversity is that it's oddly long and isn't likely to match the definition you've been carrying for the word. You're likely to think diversity means something about having different identities and points of view represented. This is so important. 99.9% .9 of the time when you hear diversity used in your schools or your workplaces, they are talking about representation. And here's what's wrong with that. And there's an excellent video by Gothics, and I'm going to link to it in the description section because she does such a fabulous job of explaining why diversity based on representation is such a problem. It's, it's actually um, backwards and kind of racist. It, if you base it on representation, you are reinforcing the avatar notion. You're reinforcing this idea that one individual who happens to be black is just the same as another individual who happens to be black. So if you have representation, people look a certain way or come from a certain background, the you know superficial characteristics, that you've got you've got those points of view covered. They're all going to think alike. That's bigotry on its face. So representation, especially based on superficial uh, characteristics and identity markers isn't going to achieve diversity. It's not. I mean, what if your representation based on race, for example, pulled all from one class or all from Americans? So they're all, you know, ethnically American, let's say. Uh, as far back as they can remember, they don't have any other kind of ethnicity going on in, in, in their background. Or what if they were all college educated? What if they're all the same age? So you see, you know, representation isn't, in and of itself, diversity. Even if you have representation across all the intersectional identity groups, you still don't necessarily have diversity of thought. They could still all have similar political views, for example. So it's a lot deeper, it's a lot more nuanced than that, and too many people think if I just cover the visual bases, I check the box and have representation, I'll be okay as a workplace or as a school. And what that leads to is discrimination. If you're fixated on representation in that way, you are by definition going to discriminate against people who deserve to be in the conversation, who deserve to be in the room, who deserve to have the job, who are better candidates for all of these things. Um, and that's not diversity. That's literally discrimination. So, um, so this, this is diversity in the critical social justice usage while occasionally claiming to be tolerant of differences of ideas and political viewpoints and nodding toward philosophical differences focuses in reality almost entirely on physical and cultural differences. And that's the problem. So I would say when you're evaluating curriculum, when you're evaluating the DEI training that your kids or you will be uh, subjected to, you need to look at that. What is it that they're talking about? And what you will find most of the time is diversity in their usage means certain groups, not white, exclusively not white, okay? Um, 
90 percent of the time not straight not cisgendered so in other words diversity equals all the things that are not white cisgendered uh and um what else straight Okay, anything that they'll call that diversity. We're a very diverse environment. We're a very diverse school, whatever. Meanwhile, everybody could hold the identical political views. They could all be from the same socioeconomic class, et cetera. That's not diverse. And they will tell you that it is. And furthermore, the idea is if you want to raise ideas that contradict the ideas that they're putting forth or the philosophy they're putting forth, you will be told that's wrong or that's racist or it's what. That is absolutely the opposite of respecting diversity. I would argue that especially through eighth grade, this kind of training, specifically this kind of training is inappropriate. It's values-based. I think if you teach kids basic manners, if you teach them to respect individuals within the classroom and you enforce that, you will get divert. And, and if you tell the teachers the same, you will get diversity. It will happen more organically. The problem is if you try to make it specific to these set sort of social justice usages, you're going to get all kinds of other weird things because it loses so much in translation. People twist it and turn it. That's how we got where we are. That's how we got to these definitions. They started off with something that seemingly could be good and it just got twisted all out of shape because it's hard to have all these different people practicing something and doing something um, the way it ought to be done when it's so damn tempting to use it for personal validation or to indoctrinate according to your own views. It's so tempting. All right, so that's diversity. Now let's go to equity social justice, he says, usage. The notion of being fair and impartial as an individual engages with an organization or system, particularly systems of grievance. Diversity had a point, equity, no. You're not gonna get anything good out of me about equity. I'm never gonna say a kind word about equity, okay? Because I don't think there should be systems of grievance. I think we have a justice system. We have a civil litigation system. If you have a legitimate grievance where your rights have been violated or somebody has defrauded you or somebody has abused you or harassed you, you deal with it through that system of grievance. If within an organization, you have an HR department or you have an administration or something like that, you deal with it that way. But the problem I have is that it's often, as he says, it's often conflated with the term equality, which means sameness and assumes incorrectly that we all have had equal access, treatment, and outcomes. In fact, true equity implies that an individual may need to experience or receive something different, not equal, in order to maintain fairness and access. For example, a person with a wheelchair may need different access to an elevator relative to someone else. So remember I mentioned the scaffolding thing before about how if you want to talk about uh, equity in terms of making sure people truly have equal access to something. So for example, blind child goes to school and you make sure there's somebody there who can help them with braille or some, you know, a deaf child has somebody who can teach them sign language and somebody doing sign language, then we can have a conversation. But if what you want to say is that not everybody is getting good grades, so we need to lower the standards for everybody so that everybody comes out the same in the end, that is the kind of equity that you're seeing most often right? And he says, notice that in critical social justice, the meaning of equity takes pains to distinguish itself from that of equality, where equality means that citizen A and citizen B are treated equally. So equality means under the law, under the law. Okay. It doesn't mean you come out equally or get the same stuff. Equity means adjusting shares in order to make citizen A and citizen B equal in their outcomes. That's what's going on in our schools. That's why we're getting rid of standardized tests. That's why we're getting rid of grades. That's why we're getting rid of specialized high schools that have entrance exams for gifted students. That's why we're getting rid of gifted programs. That's why we're getting rid of all the things that distinguish because it's really difficult to bring everybody up. That, that shows you that they acknowledge there is an up. There is a way of, you know, being more accomplished, more intelligent, more, you know, whatever it is, but shh, we're not allowed to say intelligent. We're not allowed to talk about IQ. We're not allowed to talk about these things. Okay. So they acknowledge it exists. And the proof they acknowledge it exists is that the only solution they have is to get rid of it, to hide it, to tamp it down so that everybody else appears to be succeeding. We, we don't deal with failure. We hide it. We don't help students that are struggling in school either to raise themselves up or find other opportunities for success that are not academic. Cause you know, academics are not the only means of succeeding in this world. Um, nope. We just got to bring everybody else down. This is the sort of Harrison Bergeron view of, you know, everybody's going to be equal, so we've got to hamper the people who rise above. And that could even mean discriminating against somebody who is in a, quote, marginalized group, 
Okay. This is why Asians fall in the middle. You know, Asian populations were discriminated against in their, you know, during phases of immigration, they were treated terribly. However, the culture they belong to is very pro-education. The parents are focused a lot on education. It's part of their family culture for part of their life. So they exceed, they excel rather at school and they exceed expectations of the school and sometimes dominate in the specialized schools. Now they want to take that away. So it can actually penalize people who were a minority population or marginalized population because now you've got to discriminate against them to have everybody else be equal as if that's desirable and nobody questions it. So the reason you're not gonna hear nice things out of me about equity is again, similar to diversity, it is it just went from maybe this could be, nope. <laughs> you know, it's like anything good there, once you put it in the hands of a bureaucracy, especially a self-interested one run by government or run by people whose jobs depend upon problems existing, you're going to have a bastardization. It's not going to be used properly. They're not gonna really talk about or implement things that effectively deal with helping students who are not succeeding succeed and so forth. First of all, it's complicated. It's difficult. It's time consuming. It requires a lot of thought. It requires a lot of uh, patience. It's you have to, exp it takes longer to explain when your, your goal is standardized and make everything efficient because you're dealing with thousands of students and we do have equity, we have, sorry, equality under the law. So now you have to justify why you might be treating some students a little differently than other students. That's a big hurdle to get over these days. So I just say, scrap it. I'm sorry, I hate to say that. I think you have situations where there's an obvious need, you have special needs students, they need something different, or you have a specific plan, IEP or whatever, you know, that that needs some more attention. But to think that you're going to take the average kid in the average class and worry excessively about delivering equal outcomes for that student, that that's your responsibility, no. It also, I think, sends the message that it's not the, the responsibility of the student or the parent to solve these problems. And I hate to say it, but this is a problem with public schooling, period, is you can't right all wrongs. You can't solve all the problems. You can't have a standardized system that works efficiently. At, I mean, and it's already too expensive if you're going to solve everybody's individual problem. Even as an individualist, I recognize it. It's one of the problems with the system. It's one of the reasons I disagree with the system existing, because I think you inherently create something that is going to be, you know, regression toward the mean, if not below. We're already way below there. I don't see us building it up to be anything better anytime soon. So, so we're not getting anything nice out of me, out of equity. I just think it's unworkable. Inclusion. Now, this one, he says, the notion that an organization or system is welcoming to new populations and our identities. Again, with the identities. And again, he says social justice usage. So this new presence is not merely tolerated, but expected to contribute meaningfully to the, into the system in a positive, mutually beneficial way. Inclusive processes and practices are the ones that strive to bring groups together to make decisions in collaborative, mutual, equitable ways. Now, this presupposes that's always the best way to make decisions. There's not really a lot of room for leadership, is there? There's not really a lot of room for somebody to take ownership or personal responsibility. We're diffusing the responsibility across a group. Always this, ha this may or may not be the appropriate way to do things in any situation. Um, but you know, if you're talking about being welcoming and just saying, hi, you know, you're, you're, you're welcome. We're not going to be inherently hostile towards you. Of course, inclusion is good, right? But as I'm sure you've already guessed, that's not how it usually gets used. And when they use it for this group decision-making thing. What usually ends up happening is you have a lot of people together to make a decision, but it still ends up being the loudest voices, the people who make themselves the most unpleasant to be around, um, or who just have the most money <laughs> who will win the day. Okay. So they might've been included at the table, but it very quickly devolves into, um, oftentimes a, a tyranny of the minority or a tyranny of the majority. You know, we all vote against this other person's opinion. So not everything lends itself well to being decided by group. Sometimes it's better for one person to take the helm and say, I'm going to make an executive decision and I'm going to own the outcome. And then you know exactly whom to blame and whom to hold accountable if things don't work out. That's, there's a benefit to that. It's not always bad for people to be excluded from certain decisions. Um, Let's see, so new discourses commentary. Inclusion in the general sense of the word means to welcome everybody in context into a particular space. That is to be inclusive, not to exclude anybody. 
right? But inclusion in a social justice sense refers to something subtly different. I don't think it's so subtle anymore. That extends to that idea in a particular way. It means to create a welcoming environment specifically for groups considered marginalized. And this entails the exclusion of anything that could feel unwelcoming to any identity group. So let's take the current example of girls' sports. In order to be inclusive to trans girls or trans women, we have to, by definition, exclude some biological women. And it's going to be more and more and more of them as time goes by if these policies go forward because the simple fact is that biologically trans women are still stronger, faster, more likely to succeed in a given sport than their biologically female counterparts. So this will be excluding women, excluding girls from these spaces. Sorry, that is not your safe space. It's going to be the safe space for these people. Um, and if you complain about that, then you are transphobic, you're exclusionary, you're turf, you know, you're ba all bad things. Even though what you want is you want a space that makes you feel safe and comfortable. And this is going, if they pass the uh, equality um, act or whatever it is, then you will also face that in prisons. It's going to be identity based, not even people who've gone through the transition will be just, I identify as. Um, another example where inclusion goes off the rails is where white people are excluded from conversations, from spaces, et cetera, because somebody, you know, the, the claim is that people of color or, you know, anybody non-white doesn't feel safe with them around. So it's to help this group of people feel safe. But it's really just exclusion turned inside out. So, like I said, that's why the DEI training you have to really scrutinize what do they mean. And what you will find is very often it's about saying all the reasons white people are bad and cisgender people are bad and men are bad and straight people are bad and everybody else is good. It often comes down to not you, <laughs> me, but not you. And that's the exact opposite of diversity, equity, and inclusion. So it'd be conformity, discrimination, and exclusion. And that's what I see it as most of the time. Like I said, about 99% of the time in popular usage, 95 plus percent of the time in application and DEI trainings and in curriculum. Um, the only reason, like I said, I caution you is it will give you that extra time to gather your evidence, gather your information, get your examples together before you go at an administration or school board or whatever, because the last thing you want to do is be caught flat footed and have them come back and say that they're, you know, they're doing something that's actually pretty good, or at least not bad in these ways, or they just shut you down and you're not ready with your evidence. And then you become, you know, persona non grata and you can't even get in the door. You can't even be heard. So first do your homework. And what you'll find is because these people are very eager to talk about this stuff, they're proud of it. If you can say, oh, I'm, I'm really excited to learn more about the diversity, equity, and inclusion curriculum that you're implementing at the school, where can I go to look at all the materials? I'm really curious to see what my child will be learning. I want to be helpful, et cetera. So, you know, they might believe you <laughs> that you actually want to be helpful. And maybe you will once you see that it's actually pretty benign. Who knows? You might get lucky. And then they'll, they'll point you, if they won't show them to you, that should give you pause immediately. I mean, if they're like, no, you know, we got it covered and we don't, you know, you don't need to see this and they'll see it when it comes up, then go, go full bore ahead. There's never a good reason in a public school setting, even in a private school setting. I mean, you're paying directly, you're paying double, right? Um, there's never a good reason to be denied access to curriculum materials. That is your right to see what your child is going to be learning and never let anyone tell you otherwise. Never let anyone tell you otherwise. You just keep plugging away till you find that person who understands what their job is. Um, so, and if they, if you go all the way to the tippy top and they won't go to the media, tell them I've been trying, these are the letters I've sent, make sure it's in writing. These are the responses I've gotten about why I can't see it. All I want, you know, go to the consumer affairs, whatever, go to whomever, whoever covers the local beat and just be like, do you understand this? I just kind of want to know what's going on. I'm just, my kid's going to school. It's not secret. You just need to know for your purposes with your school that these words don't mean what you think they mean or want to believe they mean. And they probably don't mean what the people using them claim they mean. Okay. Or hope you assume they mean. How's that? And you may even have thought that there was inherent value 
to having the Crayola crayon box of people in a classroom or that diversity of just what people look like was inherently a good thing. And I'm also trying to disabuse you of that notion. It's not. There's nothing inherently magical about sitting next to somebody who looks different from you in and of itself. No, and it's kind of insulting to think that way and say that. Um, there's nothing inherently bad about it either. It's neutral. It's neutral. People are people are people at the end of the day. What is beneficial is having a diversity of outlooks and ideas and experiences and viewpoints that can add to learning for you, for your child, et cetera. But only if it's truly that way, only if that's truly encouraged. If you have, as it happened to my daughters in a, a charter school, if you have what looks on the surface to be a diverse student body in that it's not all white, it's not all black, it's a, it's a rich mixture of cultures and backgrounds and races and so forth, but it is crystal clear that only one point of view, one political point of view, one philosophical point of view is welcome in every single class. It doesn't matter that it looks like the colors of the rainbow in there. It doesn't matter that they have a little, you know, LGBTQ plus club on campus. It doesn't matter because they're all conforming to the same ideas and anybody who doesn't share those ideas is unwelcome. And it's made crystal clear that they're unwelcome, regardless of what they look like, by the way. It just so happens it's most often gonna be white kids. But you could be a conservative black child or conservative Hispanic child and you know, growing up in a religious Catholic home, for example, and very quickly you will be made aware that your views are unwelcome at that table. So that's why I say it's conformity, discrimination, and exclusion. I can't even remember it, probably because they have drilled into my head DEI for so long that uh, it, I have trouble even expressing what it actually is. That's how insidious it is. Even when you know, you're still like, all right, so I hope you found this helpful. If you did, I hope you will like, share, comment, and subscribe. That's the video.